are listening to Big World Network. He rescued fair maidens with the wave of his hand And saved a princess or two With a stomp of his foot he turned dragons to sand And many a lass he did woo These are the tales of the noble one The slayer of things that are bad He defeated foul sorcerers as he went The tales of Myrick the Teenage Wizard for Hire Episode 1 The Low Down, Good for Nothing, Broken Hearted Barbarian Blues Written and Read by Baron Stevens It's not easy being a wizard. Believe me, you don't want the job. People are always demanding something from you. Sometimes, I think back to the good old days when I was just a lowly messenger for the kingdom of Fringolia. All I had to worry about then was getting the messages delivered on time, which was quite easy due to my magic running socks. Of course, the magic socks were the cause of a lot of my problems. Even though they did allow me to run for long periods of time and not grow weary... They also granted me the ability to cast magical spells. Oh, and they glowed in the dark, too. My bigger problem, though, was my impending marriage. Now, don't get me wrong. I think marriage is wonderful, and I'd love to do it someday. But 16 seemed a little young for me to settle down and start a family. I still had adventures to go on. I had less than a week left before Hermia... The girl who had decided I was her betrothed came to Castle Fringle and started the wedding bells ringing. She also happened to be the sister of another royal messenger who I worked with often. His name was Brutus, but I called him Nutboy. My dilemma was, how could I tell Hermia that she was nice and all, but I wasn't ready for marriage yet? Everything I thought to say sounded weak and lame. I decided to do what any other perplexed male of our species would do. Run. Well, maybe run wasn't the right word. Let's just call it a vacation to get away and think things through a little more. The tropical country of Imia sounded like a good place for that, especially with all the palm trees, beaches, and gorgeous women who were rumored to be there. Since I needed to have a good reason to head to Imia, I decided to visit my overseer to see if there were any messages I could take there to help pay for my travel expenses. As I crossed the courtyard, I saw a giant hulk of a man walking toward me with his head bowed and shoulders sagging. In spite of it being early spring with snow still on the ground, he only wore a loincloth. The sword he carried on his back was large enough to skewer a dragon clean through. I said cheerfully to him, Hey, Nonak, my bulky barbarian buddy, what's up? Nonak stopped and slowly looked up. A huge frown spread across his normally jovial face. Oh, hi, Marik, he said in his thick barbarian accent. I tilted my head as I walked up to him. What's wrong? Is the weather too warm for you? Nonak nodded. Yaw. Und Frederica say not von see Nonak any more. What? I asked. Nonak had been hanging around Castle Fringle for several months and appeared to be on his way to the altar to wed the also brawny Princess Frederica. The two were simply made for each other. What happened? I asked as I walked up beside him and put a compassionate hand on his arm. Everything went black. Nonak's inhumanly fast barbarian reflexes had pulled me into a hug. There was no fighting it. All I could do was remain in his embrace and hope he'd let go of me before I lost consciousness. Fortunately, this time, he did. Thanks for hug, Nonak said as he put me down. Yeah, any time, I wheezed, checking my ribs for injury. Nonak want to say goodbye. Goodbye. He turned and resumed his sullen walk toward the castle gate. 
Where are you going? I asked, after I took a deep breath to make sure I could. Nonak go home to Eremik. Nonak, you can't leave, I said. True. The guy had a brain the size of a walnut, but you couldn't find a more loyal friend in all the Twelve Kingdoms. Nonak just continued marching toward the gate. I ran up to him and grabbed his arm. Wait, my friend. How about if we leave together? Nonak stopped and scrunched his bushy brows together. Marik go to Aramik with Nonak? But Marik and Hunya get married. I winced and inhaled through my teeth. Well, you see, I don't think we're ready for that yet. Also, I have some important messages I need to deliver to Imia, which is many dangerous miles away from here. I sure could use someone to protect me on the way. Nonak's brow remained scrunched. Brutus not go? Um, Brutus is kind of busy right now. He's carrying some messages to Reba. Besides, he's as much protection as a feather dipped in cow dung. Also, I didn't know if Brutus would understand about me skipping out of the castle in order to avoid marrying his sister, but I decided not to encumber Nonak's thought process with that. Nonak just stood there, rubbing his chin. Finally, he shook his head and said, Imia, too hot. It will be nice, trust me. There are palm trees and golden beaches, not to mention tons of foul monsters along the way that need to be vanquished. I knew he probably wouldn't care about the climate there, but any opportunity to prove his barbarianness against monsters always won out. He nodded as a grin formed on his face. Yeah, sound like fun. Go kill monsters with Marik. Yeah, that's the spirit. And I'm sure there will be lots, I said, rubbing my hands together. Of course, I was counting on most monsters to still be hibernating, but I wasn't telling him that. I'll meet you at the gate in five minutes after I pick up the messages. Nonak nodded, still smiling, as he stomped toward the castle entrance. Unfortunately, when I checked with the messenger overseer, he didn't have any messages needing delivery to Imia. I figured it wouldn't hurt Nonak to not know about that little tidbit. I then headed back to the bunkhouse to grab my gear. I met Nonak a few minutes later. We had to stop by his cottage in the village for him to grab his shoulder bag and some clothes before heading off to the beautiful beaches of Imia for some fun in the sun. We trudged down the road, thick with mud, for an hour without speaking. The one unfortunate thing about Nonak was that it was impossible to engage in mentally stimulating conversations with him. Finally, I broke the silence by asking, So, what happened between you and the princess? Nonak shook his shaggy mane of black hair. Nonak not know. Nonak profess love. Princess say can't marry Nonak, that Nonak need to leave. His frown returned, and his shoulders slumped so low I thought they might drag on the ground. But why? I thought you two were hitting it off really well. Nonak answered. Viver. Princess say Nonak not smart. Can't be king. Princess needs someone smart to marry. Ouch. I couldn't help but feel for the big guy. I patted his arm. Don't worry, buddy. There are plenty of other fish in the sea. Why fish help? Nonak asked. Nonak need woman, not fish. I laughed. It's just an expression, my friend. It means there are plenty of other women out there in the world looking for a guy just like you. Really? he asked. Women in Aramic not like Nonak. Say Nonak not husband material. What? What's not to like? You're strong? You, uh, have really big muscles. And you're really strong, too. Nonak's frown faded as he slowly nodded. Yeah. Nonak, find new fish. He slapped me on the back, sending me flying forward. After I pulled myself out of the mud, we trudged on until dark and made camp. The next morning... It had grown colder, and snow had fallen. In fact, it had grown so cold, 
Nonak actually put on his shirt and some pants. At least the muddy road was now solid and easier to traverse, so we made good time. At noon, we crossed a mostly frozen creek and headed up a hill covered with spruce trees. I heard a strange wishing noise. What was that? I asked. Nunak stopped, brows scrunched, as he looked about. Nunak smell magic. I don't, I said. Of course, I never could, but Nunak seemed to have a sense for it. I guess it made it easier for him to hunt down and slay wizards. I was still working on getting him to give up that career since, technically, I was on his hit list. Before we could resume our journey, three men in black armor seemed to materialize out of nowhere. They saw us and charged. Now, when Nonak has his sword out, he can easily take out an entire army by himself. In this instance, he didn't have time to draw it and had to use his bare fists which meant he could only deal with about a hundred enemy warriors. These three, however, were really fast. Nonak managed to step between them and me before slamming his fist into the face mask of the closest assailant. The man went down with a clank as black armor met frozen mud. The other two, though, managed to avoid Nonak's deadly fists and charged toward me. Nonak spun around and latched onto the back of another enemy's armor before pulling him down. That left one for me to take care of. Fortunately, I had prepared myself for emergencies just like this. I had some spell components tucked into pouches along my belt. I grabbed the first one and threw it at the enemy as I chanted, A billet, milse, a re, uyo. The combination of slime beetle dung and chameleon rat saliva should have instantly turned him into a slime beetle. Instead, the powder bounced off his armor without changing him. Was his armor warded against magic? Just as he put his sword up to my neck, I realized the second pouch on my belt was the slime beetle spell. The one I threw at him was actually the spell of breath freshening. Whoops. You're coming with us, the black armored warrior said, his mint-like breath washing over me. He pushed me to the ground and pressed his sword harder into my neck. I tried to speak, but all that came out was, Oot-foo! The enemy loosened his grip enough to allow me to speak. Before I could ask him what this was about, he ended up flying thirty feet into the trees and smacked with a loud metallic thunk into the trunk of a rather large spruce tree. Nonak stood above me, brushing off his hands. Marik okay? he asked. Yeah, fine, thanks, I said, sitting up and checking my neck for wounds. There were none. Nonak stopped and sniffed the air again. His eyes narrowed as he snarled. Nonak smell wizard. He spun around as a man in a black robe appeared behind him. The man in the robe waved his hand and Nonak stopped as if frozen solid. I snatched the slime beetle components from my belt and started to throw them at the newcomer, but he waved his hand again, sending my pouch flying several yards away. We'll have none of that now, he said. I started to stand, but he waved his hand a third time. I, too, suddenly couldn't move. The black-robed man shook his head and smiled as he came up to stand directly in front of me. So you are the one called Myrick the Magnificent. I'm sorry, but I really don't see anything magnificent. All I see is a short, pimple-faced teenager with no natural talent. Who are you? I asked, surprised that I could even speak. Who I am is not important. What is important is that you come with me. He pointed behind him, and a vertical black hole opened up. The man headed toward it. I lifted off the ground and floated toward the strange portal. Oh, cabbage, I swore. These are the tales of the noble one, the slayer of things that are bad. He defeated foul sorcerers as he went, the tales of Myrick the so Magnificent. Hmm.
You're listening to Big World Network.